Uma Gyanti Mirandas, ya, Kinarjana Salaka, ya, Chaksu, Um Milita Vienna, Das Mai Sri Gurvinaha, Ma Om Vishnu Badai Krishna, Pastai Ruta Lai, Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste, Sarah, what did they say? Go to Bali, the Chadimini, she says, Sindhi Ravi, Pastiat Gede is the time. When she called the rope is Jack, he was Sindhu, but a Bichap, the Titanum, Pavane Bio, Vaishnavi Bio, and Mahomaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda. Sri Advaita Gadadha Rasi Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Rindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So devotees will continue with our discussion on the Shikshastakam prayers. Um, yesterday we did or we did a overview of the fourth verse, which is the same discussion topic today. And today we'll uh, go into the verse in more detail. Yesterday we described the uh, same principles that we have been repeating every class that each of these verses is a, is a step towards the ultimate goal of uh, pure bhakti, uh, Sudha bhakti, ananya bhakti, that bhakti which is free from any other considerations except pure love for Krishna in the mood of spontaneous service. That is the goal in these verses. Gradually uh, delineate or what we say express a particular stage on the bhakti ladder, going from the Dao Strata Sadhu Sangha Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivriti Tishta, and Ruchi. And so, Ruchi, we're on the fifth stage right now, which is Ruchi. Oh, no, actually, the sixth stage is Ruchi, I'm sorry. And this verse illustrated, it's the fourth verse in Shikshastik and Prayers. And yesterday we described a little bit about the position of this verse in relationship to the whole process and some of the uh, principles that arise in, in order to practice this. In other words, some of the qualities that arise in order to practice this level of devotion. Mahaprabhu is speaking this verse in complete renunciation for everything material and in doing that, he points out the most, uh, what we say, obvious desires of the materialists. What do they look for? The materialists or people in the material world are simply saturated with desires. And, but these ones that are mentioned here are more of the more prominent desires of the avid materialists. And we'll read the verse. Nadanam, Najanam, Nasundarim, Kavitam, Vajagadish, Shakamuye, Manma, Janmani, Janmani, Ishware, Bhavita, Bhakti, Ohoituki, Twayi. O Lord of the universe, I do not desire material wealth, materialistic followers, a beautiful wife, or fruit of activities described in the flowery language. All I want life after life is unmoted devo devotional service to you. So here on this platform of Ruchi, Ruchi means sweet taste, that one has developed a sweet taste in the execution of bhakti, coming from the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, and following the process of bhakti as given by the spiritual teachers. So on this four, fourth verse, the Lord is referred to as Jagadish, Jagadisha, or Jagadish actually, Lord of the universe. So the Lord, so Lord Chaitanya is directing his prayer in this way towards Jagadish, or the Lord of the universe. And he says, material wealth, not interested, 
materialistic followers, don't want them. A beautiful wife, not interested. Fruit of activities desired in, the, in flowery language, well, that requires some explanation. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur gives a little bit. It says, I even don't want to be known as a great orator of the Vedas. Even though I may know the Vedas and can express the Vedas, I'm not looking for the recognition that comes with this type of knowledge. So the Sundarim has two meanings. It usually refers to the, the, the a beautiful wife or the desire to be recognized for one's Vedic knowledge. Um, and then what does he say? I don't want anything but one thing. I want your unmotivated devotional service to you. And as we explained in the previous discussion, discussion I'm willing to accept this position of being your servant life after life. It's not that I want to uh, go back in this life. If you want to take me back to you or your, your spiritual abode in this life, I am very happy. But if you want to leave me here for whatever reason, I'm also happy because all I want is to serve you wherever I am. And that's my happiness. So, and he says in a way that is unmotivated. So let us look at these uh, desires. Yesterday, we didn't speak about these. We spoke about the meaning of the verse in general. But today we can look about this. Material wealth. People work tirelessly in order to gain material work. They sacrifice time, energy, whatever they have in order to get material wealth. They may, even, in some cases, people may even commit crimes in order to get materialistic wealth. It's called dunham, or what is called, yeah, dunham means, in this case, wealth. Um, wealth, Prabhupada used to say, for the materialist, money is the honey, because they think, if you have money, you're happy. If you have money, you can do things. If you have money, you can get things. If you have money, you can control so many things, other people also. So people aspire very hard for material wealth. And you'll see uh, a person will labor continuously. Even people who have wealth, it becomes an addiction. They're never satisfied with the amount they have. In one lecture, Srila Prabhupada was uh, parroting or imitating a materialist. They look at their bank account, they read the amount, they say, oh, I have a million dollars, but still, I want two million. If they have two million, they want five million. If they have 5 million, they want uh, 50 million. So this desire for wealth is always there and always increasing. And even if a person is not like that, which is not most of their person, because they, when they find some source of get wealth, they want to continue. And it's almost like an alcoholic. You'll see people who are addicted to you know, intoxicating substances. Uh, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is or where they can get it, but they want it. And sometimes if they don't get it, they'll commit crimes to get the money, to get the alcohol. So in the same way, just getting materialistic wealth is more like a type of addiction. And once people get addicted to getting it, they want more and more and more, even if it's they don't need it, still it is a type of addiction. But for a devotee, 
he understands that the real wealth is bhakti. Because bhakti allows one to ultimately, when bhakti reaches maturity, he controls the Supreme Personality of Godhead by his love. Although he's not trying to control the Lord by his love, still the Lord becomes controlled by love. As is mentioned, nothing can control the Lord. In fact, the Lord is swarat. Swarat means independent, but it means fully independent. Nityo, uh, nityanam, chaitanas chaitananam, eko bahodam, vidadati kamam. He is greater than everyone, not only in position, but in complete opulence too. He has more wealth than everybody. He has more followers. He has uh, more fame. He has more strength. He has more renunciation. He has more beauty. He has more knowledge. In all categories of opulence, the Lord is supreme. So therefore, one who gets the favor of the Lord is never lacking anything. Because when you're connected to the wealthiest person and that person's inclined to you by your bhakti, you're wealthy, even if you don't want it. Because the wealth of bhakti allows you to control the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Of course, again, no one tries to control the Lord, but the Lord is automatically controlled by love. As Prabhupada gives the example of a, uh, he talks about this one incident that happened in, I think it was in Bombay or Delhi, I'm not sure. One very re important man, I think he was a governor or something. And uh, one man came to see the governor and uh, so his secretary met, met the visitor and said, well, the governor is busy right now, uh, but if you wait, then he'll be available. So the man was sitting in the waiting room waiting. And after one hour, he was still waiting. And then he was thinking, well, what's going on? What is he doing? Why is he, you know, so he decided to take a peek. So he went inside and was able to look inside the door where the uh, governor was. And he saw the governor was on his hands and knees and his little grandson was on his back. And he was piggybacking the boy all around the room, playing with the boy and making the boy feel happy. And of course, the governor was also feeling happy too. So this is love. He wasn't interested in his business so much. So business is nice, but when it comes to love, it's superior. So you'll see how this little grandson of this wealthy person absorbed complete time where he didn't even consider his day-to-day -day work. So this is an example of how Krishna, how Krishna works is that when one has love, Krishna is available. And when Krishna, when Krishna comes, he comes with everything else. The Lord, he doesn't want that. Lord Chaitanya tried to give unlimited wealth to many of his followers. And many of them just said, my dear Lord, I'm simply happy in your devotion and service. I'm not interested in gaining anything material. Pallad Maharaj, when he was offered anything by Nishringadev, he said, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not a merchant, I'm not interested. So when one has love for Krishna, one has everything. So here he's saying, I don't desire wealth. Don't want followers, people in the material world. If they, get, if they don't have followers, sometimes they try to create followers. Like this verse, when it says Janam, also means family members. Uh, the Acharyas give the definition of Janam, Mad Janam, means I don't even want the, the pleasure of being followed by those persons who are my wife, my husband, my children, 
my relatives, my friends, or even people in general. I'm not interested in these things. A person may have them, but they're not something that they desire. They do it as a duty, but their happiness is not in those things. Their happiness is in Krishna. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, every, every man wants a beautiful wife, someone who can float down from the heavenly planets, playing on a harp, singing so sweetly, surrounded by all, all kinds of uh, decorations. Every man dreams of some kind of celestial being who will become his wife. Of course, most of the time it doesn't happen. But this is their dream, to get a beautiful wife, or a qualified wife like that. But Lord Chaitanya, he had Vishnu Priya. She was, she was a daughter of a very great pundit uh, who was also very uh, reputable in the area he was living. But still, she, he was, she was dutiful, chaste, and did everything to satisfy Lord Chaitanya. He left all that. He left his wife. He left the followers. He never was interested in material wealth, although he was born in a, a very good Brahmin family. They had wealth. They never had any shortages. Still, he left everything and he took the sannyas order of life. So, the Lord points out these things as something that is undesirable because I have something better. There is the story of, uh, of this one man. He was worshiping Lord Shiva and uh, he wanted material wealth because Shiva is called Asuntos, he's easily pleased. And so, if you please the Lord Shiva, it doesn't take much to please Lord Shiva. If you offer him a bale leaf with some devotion, with nice prayers, Lord Shiva is pleased. And he may offer you a material benediction. So this man was worshiping. Um, Lord Shiva. And so Shiva appeared to him and said, what do you want? He said, well, I want unlimited wealth. I want so much wealth. Shiva remembered that there was a sadhu, his name was Sanatan Goswami, and he was sitting in a place near Vrindavan called um, Dasa, Dasa Vidya Tir, 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 Tir. Das, uh, I can't remember. He was sitting on the mountain and uh, he was doing his banja. He said, Shiva said, you go to him and he has a touchstone. Now there is such a thing as a touchstone. Touchstone is a, a type of stone. You can't find it on this planet anymore, but it, it does exist in other places that if you take it and you touch it to anything metal, that metal becomes gold just by touching it. So Shiva, Shiva said, you go and you ask uh, Sanatan Goswami for his touchstone. So the man became excited. He found Sanatan Goswami he came, he offered his obeisances, he was thinking how to make his request. Finally, Sanatana Goswami said, you've come to get something? And the man said, yes, actually, I was sent by Lord Shiva. He says, you have a touchstone, so I want that touchstone. So Sanatana Goswami said, well, if you go, just down that road a little bit, you'll see a, a trash pile. And in that trash pile, you'll find the touchstone. So he was excited. He left. 
found this trash pile, looked through it, and there it was, the touchstone. Picked it up, he started to touch metal, he was getting gold, he was becoming more and more wealthy. But then at one point, after some time, he thought, hmm, you know, Sanatan Goswami is not a fool. He must have something more valuable than a touchstone. Why would he throw the touchstone in the garbage? Well, if he's got something more valuable, I'm going to ask him for that. <coughs> so he came back after some time, again, and offered his respect. And Siddhartha greeted him again. And then he said, you know, I, I believe you have something more valuable than the touchstone which you gave me. I would like that. So Nathan Goswami said, you're correct. Can I have it? Well, you can have it, but you have to throw your touchstone away first. Throw my touchstone away? Yes. Then you can have this more valuable gift. So he had faith in Sanatan Goswami, although he was somewhat reluctant, still his faith was strong. And so he took his touchstone and threw it into the garbage. Actually threw it into the river so he couldn't get it again. And that was the idea to get rid of it completely. So then he came back and he said, I have thrown my touchstone in the river. Please give me this more valuable gift. Sanatana Goswami said, okay, repeat after me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So he gave him that which is the most valuable, the chanting of Krishna's holy name. So Lord Chaitanya is using this, these examples of great material desires, followers, wealth, beautiful wife, beautiful husband, uh, recognition, being known as the great scholar of the Vedas. None of these things really have any interest in my life because I have, I have something better. I have devotional service to you. So this verse is giving us the understanding of the superiority of devotional service and the insignificant uh, position of anything in this material world. Actually, anything material is temporary. It doesn't stand the test of time. It comes in time. It goes within time. And time moves things along. No one can keep anything they have in this world. But one thing we can always keep, which is more valuable than anything we can keep, and that is our relationship with Krishna and pure devotional service. So he, the Lord says, all I want is life after life, janmani, janmani, ishvare, is unmotivated devotional service to you. So the scriptures explain that when one is fixed in devotional service, they are free from all suffering. They are free from all anxieties. They are free from any, anything that will cause any kind of discomfort or distress. Because they're happy simply by executing devotional service. So this plan, this devote, this plan, this particular verse is about the sweet taste that one derives from, from execution of devotional service. As we have mentioned before, devotional service is sweet. It's susukam kartam abhyayam, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. It brings unlimited happiness. Nayam deho deho bhaja nirloke kastam kama arati vidbhujan jay Brahma Sokyam Anantam. Brahma Sokyam Anantam. 
Brahma refers to spiritual. Sokyam refers to happiness. Spiritual happiness is ananta, unlimited. As Lord Chaitanya said in the first verse of Shikshastaka, anandam bhudivardhanam, an ocean of material, an ocean of spiritual happiness, unlimited spiritual happiness. So by following the process and getting through the anarthas, at least most of the anarthas, as Bhakti Vinod Thakur instructs, one should at least rid themselves of 75% of the anarthas, and then one can get the taste, the sweet, continuous taste of bhakti. And bhakti is sweet because bhakti is the internal energy of Krishna, personified by Srimati Radharani, who is always eager to give Krishna to others who are qualified to receive. So this is one of the qualifications of getting Krishna's mercy, not wanting these material things. To have these material things is not a disqualification. To try to enjoy them is. <laughs> Enjoyment is on the spiritual platform. So wealth can be used to live nicely and to engage in devotional service and to support Materialistic follow followers, just followers in general, can be engaged in service. One who has followers can engage them in devotional service. A beautiful wife, well, that can be a problem sometimes because it says it's one of the, one of the curses that one can uh, encounter in life is having a beautiful wife because then everybody else is also looking at her in different ways for different reasons. So uh, if your wife is beautiful, well, I wish you the best, good luck. <laughs> if she's not, then you're in a better position for Krishna conscious. But in any case, beautiful or not beautiful, and the, the material external situation is not an impediment for our devotional service. As long as we stay fixed, mostly on chanting the holy names of the Lord, because as this, these verses are really talking about the sweet taste that develops on a higher and higher level as we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So these verses very significant. Um, and humility increases on this level because one who is after materialistic wealth, followers, or the pleasures of the opposite sex cannot practice humility. It's not possible. Because they're feeding their false ego and humility is what destroys the false ego. So it's contrary. Uh, I want to clarify for those who may misunderstand what I'm presenting is to have material things is not a disqualification. To have too much can be a disqualification. To have too little can also be a disqualification. Not disqualification, it just makes bhakti more difficult. So one who has just what they need and is not interested in trying to uh, get more or to put their position better in this material world. We're trying to get out of the material world. We're not trying to fortify our position in this material world for some prestige or for some material gain. <clears throat> So no one can understand the glories of pure devotional service unless until you're on that platform because it's so satisfying, it's so complete, it attracts Krishna. It's also very rare to achieve, but it is more or less rare by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who's made it easy through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. 
Okay, these are some points on this particular voice, uh, on this particular verse. Any questions or comments? Thank you so much, Maharaj. That was very nice. Uh, so much to learn from this verse. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Devotees, are there any questions? Please go ahead. There's one, there's, there's one on the chat. Can you read that one? Okay, sure, Maharaj. Uh, it's from Premavati Devidasi Maharaj. It's hard for me to not want to have personal relationship with family members. I love them and during the last years, I develop a strong attachment to them. Yeah, th that's fine, but it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be the, an impediment for your devotional service. If it becomes, if you have to choose between the two, we have to see. So we can, it doesn't mean you have, you, you dislike your family members or don't like your family members. In fact, there it can be, but you have to understand that this affection is temporary. It's come into being and at some time it will leave. The stronger the attachment to others, the harder it is when they when that attachment is broken. And the attachment will be broken in time, or may even be broken sooner than we expect. So a devotee is not insensitive to other people relationships with other people, but he's not attached. The difference between responsibility and relationship to others and attachment is different. We have responsibility to take care of our family. We may also have, a, we should have affection for them. Otherwise, there's no motivation for that family life. If you don't have any, any affection for family life, then you can easily practice Krishna consciousness. But if you are in family life, stay there, practice devotional service, become more and more fixed in your relationship with Krishna. <clears throat> family members can be enemies or they can be supports. Yeah. Because generally, when it comes to family members, we don't choose them. They come by way of our karma. Karma brings about these relationships. And then we develop a deeper relationship based on that association and that relationship as husband or wife or child or parent, whatever it is. Lord Chaitanya. He was very kind to his mother and he also loved his mother. But at one point he left everything to practice pure devotional service. So our love for Krishna is tantamount or paramount, paramount to everything. It supersedes the love that we can receive and what the love that we can give to family members is insignificant in terms of its volume compared to a relationship with Krishna. If we want unlimited, everlasting love, it's found in Krishna. And it's easily available if we focus on it. If we make it a goal, Krishna also, Krishna wants to love you more, Krishna does love you more than then you actually can possibly ever love him. As Krishna is the greatest in any category, he's also the greatest lover also. There's no limit to his love. And there's no limit to the happiness in that relationship. That's available. 
And that's why great souls can look at this world and have no interest at all because they, they're tasting something so sweet and so permanent. But if you have relationships with family members, fine. But don't let that, allow that to be an impediment to your developing your relationship with Krishna. Yeah, now it's changed, right? Thank you, Premavati. So happy that you are joining us on this talk. My obeisances to you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, Guru Maharaj, as you were speaking about, you know, the things to be attached to and not to be attached to, I was wondering about feeling attached to the outcome of our devotional pursuits. So for example, um, you know, when we used to do university outreach, we used to feel discouraged about, you know, the number of people who would come to the events and I and I understand that it's not important in the long run but is that feeling something that is devotional or is that a material kind of attachment initially the initial feeling is fine but don't don't stay with it if you just if you linger into that mood then 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 it's then it's sentimental and it's material because you're thinking, well, I'm the doer, and because I didn't do it, therefore I'm not, I'm not happy. The initial feeling, oh, it's good. just like when we use that same understanding, which is the principle, when someone dear to us leaves the body, then we feel unhappy, there's some sadness. That's fine, that's normal, that's human, that's natural. But if we linger into that like week after week, day after day, then it becomes material sentiment. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, our expectations in devotional service, if they fall short, oh, we feel, oh, maybe I could have did it better this way. So we feel a little disappointed and we may also look on how we can improve the next time. But don't carry that around um, for, for an extended period of time, move on and then make something happen in a positive way, just keep going. You see the point, the initial feeling is normal, but after that, then move on to our in next service. Okay. Thank you. Does that makes sense? Yes, very much. Sometimes that, that feeling of like holy discontent can last a while, but um, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah. There's so much more to do. Why should, why should we linger about our so-called failures? And then again, there's another aspect to it. What is successful? What is a failure? I can give you two examples I'm using your same the same example you gave. When Prabhupada was in New York in the early days, devotees wanted to have a big program. So they didn't know how to advertise. So they were just putting posters on signboards in the outside environment. Uh, uh, Swami from India will speak on the science of bhakti and come to this auditorium at 7 p.m. on this day. And then there was a slight fee. Okay, so the devotees had worked tirelessly advertising the program. And then when the program came, seven people showed up. 
and it was the hall was could hold a couple hundred people. They rented this big place. So the devotees were really disappointed. And Prabhupada preached to those seven people like there was 700 people there. And then after the devotees expressed their disappointment of the, the low turnout, then Prabhupada said, well, didn't you see? Narada Muni was here. Narada Muni came. And Prabhupada could see Narada Muni. <laughs> and then there's another, and Prabhupada said, don't be disappointed by the turnout. Actually, Narada Muni came. And then there's another example in the life of one preacher in our movement. His, prof his professor, he arranged the program for one professor at one college. And so uh, it wasn't a regular class. It was an extra class. The professor was in, inspired by this devotee. So he arranged for his class to come, but it was voluntary because it was wasn't a scheduled class. So there was some advertising. And then when the program came, one person came. <laughs> Just one. And so the professor said, well, let's go to my office. So the devotee, the professor, and the one student, they came into the office. And so this devotee preached to both the professor and that one student. That one student became, he actually joined and not only did he join, but when he joined, he actually made fast advancement in devotional service. Now he's one of the uh, prominent persons under that devotee's care in a yatra. In other words, he's a manager, he's an organizer, he's, a, uh, he's also a preacher. And he's respected by so many others. So only one person come, came. But that person was a, became a devotee. And the statement by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, our business is to preach. And if nobody comes, we preach to the four walls. He says, it doesn't matter how many comes or who comes, we preach. That's our business. I went to a one jail program one time and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be good. And the uh, person who I organized the program with, he said, yeah, yeah. He was really excited about, you know, the whole program. And so when I got there, none of the inmates came because they, they could come on their own or not come. So it's just me, a few devotees, and the professor. I am in, into the, the jailer, I'm sorry. So he was so interested, he said, well, let's have a program anyway. So we chanted, and then I preached to the professor. <laughs> and he loved it. And then as I was preaching to the professor, some of the inmates started to become curious what's going on inside there. So could they could hear the kirtan. So they, some of them started to drift in and sat into the class. So our business is to preach. We want good turnouts. We want we want thousands of people to come. I'm looking at the number of participants that is on my on this class now that says 24 and actually 23. 23. I could say, well, 23, that's that's not such good numbers. Why, why can't it be 50 or 60 or something like that? But 23 people, that's wonderful. So, preaching is on the transcendental platform. Service is on the transcendental platform. Results are in the hands of Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, there is one more question from Premavati Mataji. She's, okay. She says it's hard for me to understand the difference between humility and vulnerability because it seems that sometimes when I try to be humble, I'm actually putting myself in a 
vulnerable position which can be attracting people to control me does my question make sense i missed some of the words it's hard the difference between humility and what uh, vulnerability i'm sorry if i'm uh, saying it can you post post it up i i i can't understand your question post it on the chat so i can see the yeah uh, so, it, oh, Vulnerability. Okay. Sorry, Maharaj. Yeah. Humility is a, is a quality of the soul. Materialistic people may take advantage of someone, and that's their business to somehow or take advantage of others. So we shouldn't allow people to take advantage of us. When we see that happening, we have to. Uh, act in such a way is to stop that or prevent that. So what we do is generally, uh, devotee is humble. Humble means that it's not so much the er external show of humility, it's the inner, inner mood of humility. The inner mood of humility is not wanting honor from anyone else not wanting to be glorified. These are the qualities of humility. Humility is a characteristic that one finds happiness just doing service. Whereas a person who's not humble, they're, they're always looking for something outside of the service or something along with the service. But a, hum a humble person is just happy with the service. I get a chance to serve. That's my that's my uh, good fortune. That's a quality of humility. But when you're with non devotees, a lot of times they even non devotees also appreciate humility. But sometimes, when people are in a certain mindset, they may try to, you know, take advantage. And if you see that happening, then you can just uh, put the brakes on. In other words, you have to act in such a way that it doesn't go anywhere. You either get out of that association or you, when you see someone is trying to take advantage of you, then you have to see, is it being done consciously or just by, by way of situation? The situation can may also dictate a person will try to take advantage. We get we got that question in our previous talk about people who are in the workplace and who are you know practicing humility and then they find themselves in a very competitive type of atmosphere where humility is seen as a type of weakness. Mm -hmm. But humility is strength because it allows you to take shelter of Krishna. It allows you to be protected by Krishna also. Genuine humility. What is real? What's the real definition of humility or what is the essential definition of humility is that Krishna is everything and I'm nothing. Therefore, if I just remember Krishna, and I depend on Krishna in every situation, I'm happy. I can move forward in whatever I'm doing in life. I hope that helps. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we it's uh, we're at the hour. Normally we chant around as a part of concluding our program, but on Sundays I have a different schedule, and as soon as the hour is over, I have to go. 
It's just on Sundays I have a, I meet with uh, a certain devotee right after, uh, right on the hour. So I don't want to keep this devotee waiting. Um, so I have to leave, but we'll continue tomorrow and we'll uh, go on to the next verse, verse number five. And then we'll resume our regular chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as the concluding part of the program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you for Thank the you. enlightening class. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Shuri. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank, Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Over to Leela. Thank I'll you, Guru Maharaj. Namrata Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.